The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Forever in Glory by Richard Jensen from his album Worship. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on or about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Now, at this point, we digress and defer to the inevitable atheist, the skeptics, the doubting Thomas's objections. Inevitably, they ask a third question. Aren't there verses in the Bible that teach God creates or is responsible for evil? Uh, they will go run to, inevitably, any one of a number of verses, uh, which I won't care to mention all of the verses at this point due to time constraints. However, if you look throughout the lexicon of supposed uh, Bible uh, difficulties and contradictions, uh, they will come to any one of a number of about 50 different verses which in part or in whole are ostensibly supposed to give us the indication that God creates and is responsible for evil. You can turn to uh, 1 Samuel 16.14 uh, or 15, chapter 16, one, 2 Samuel 12.11 1 Kings 14.10, 1 Kings 22.23, uh, 2 Chronicles 18.22, 2 Chronicles 34.24, Isaiah 45.7, Jeremiah 6.19, Lamentations 3.38, and the list goes on. Those are just a few of the classic verses which uh, skeptics, atheists, and the doubting Thomas will encounter and use as their proof text that God, in fact, creates evil or is an inference himself evil. Now, by reviewing and studying these verses, we come to a very different uh, result than do the atheist, agnostics, skeptics, and doubting Thomases. The answer to question three, aren't, aren't there verses in the Bible that teaches that God creates or is responsible for evil? The, the answer to those questions is, well, firstly, number one, every verse must be read and understood according to the context of both the immediate and the entire context of scripture as it relates to God's nature and his relationship to his creation. You can't just take one verse and then uh, build your entire theology around that verse. You have to take all of what is revealed and try to thread it together and understand what is God saying about himself and his relationship to man. Two, God uses, permits, and allows evil as a natural and a supernatural consequence for and to man's personal and national actions and decisions. So it is action, reaction on the part of God. Three, God does not look forward to or enjoy evil. 
He's not sitting there planning evil for evil's sake so that he gets enjoyment out of it. It is as re- always as a result of man getting the ball rolling and then God simply waiting there for the logical consequence thereof. For God purposes that good and evil for his ultimate plan of salvation for those who will ultimately respond to it. 5. Satan, the world, the flesh, all plan, purpose, and to use evil to overcome and thwart and counter God, whereas, in contrast, as I said before, uh, the fourth point, God purposes both good and evil for his ultimate plan of salvation. So the two are in stark contrast. One is for salvation, the other is to destruction, depending on whether you're talking about God or whether you're talking about Satan, the world, the flesh, and mankind. Six, in general, First Kings 22:19 and to 23, uh, one of which was mentioned above, and uh, other numerous uh, verses give similar support to the idea that the, the Bible merely expresses what God allows, not what He initiates or forces to happen. It's His permissive will. Question four: What is the purpose of evil? Well, by beginning from the assumption that man is good, man has difficulty understanding why evil befalls him. Uh, When we correct our assumption to understand all of us are fallen, then we can look at verses like Romans 3.28, which say, quote, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, unquote. When we look and study at that verse and understand that all means all, and none of us come close to God's perfection, then we come to a proper view of man's condition, which allows us to honestly ask the correct question. Instead of asking what is the purpose of evil, a correct understanding of our condition and being fallen and separated from God by our sin would lead us to ask the question, quote, why would a perfect and just God tolerate any of us? As a result, we know that God would be justified to send all of mankind into hell. Alternately, God could choose to allow everyone, including the devil, into heaven. But the reality is that neither of those would, neither of those outcomes would satisfactorily demonstrate the fullness of God's nature. As a result, Romans 8.28 perhaps gives us the best reason for evil. Romans 8.28 says, quote, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose, unquote. So, like everything else, God can and does use all things to achieve his purposes and plans for eternity. Uh, this is significant because it means that evil, death, disease, suffering, sorrow, and evil in general have a purpose. Now, this is in contrast to uh, the, the idea that according to uh, atheists, evolutionists, agnostics, uh, ultimately, when you look at their quote-unquote theology, there is no purpose or meaning to evil. Uh, worse yet, uh, there is no good. Uh, only random cause and effect. Uh, accepting the reality that of God, we also realize that while God does not create the end result of evil, Instead, God uses the effects of sin, evil, to eventuate and move all things into harmony to achieve his plan of good for those who are called according to his purpose of reconciliation and salvation. Likewise, Romans 8, 35 through 39, uh, in the same passage, continues with this topic, giving a series of, of challenging questions which ultimately concern the issue of God's personal an intimate concern, control, protection, and preservation in the spiritual life and destiny of the believer. If you study those uh, verses, you'll find verses 8 through 39 say the following, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, 
nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So ultimately, when we look at life, we need to remember this world and the present time is not eternity. Regardless of how bad or evil things may presently seem to be, now is not the end result. Now is not eternity. God lives outside eternity. God knows the conclusion from the beginning. Uh, C.S. Lewis, the uh, famous author, gave an uh, excellent example of this uh, very issue. Uh, in his analogy, he uses the issue of uh, the concept of writing a book. And if you look at the interplay between the author writing the book and the imaginary characters who are portrayed inside the book, you can put yourself in both roles and thereby get a glimpse and an understanding of this uh, concept of finite versus reality time versus outside of time. For example, you can imagine that a book has a beginning, it has an end, it may have any one of a number of chapters uh, generally which begin with perhaps the birth of a character moving through the uh, growth and various stages of the person's life uh, as they progress through time and to ultimately the character's uh, demise or until uh, they achieve some goal, uh, whatever it may be. Now, to the character in the book, it would depend on opening the book, just randomly looking at a chapter, a, a particular paragraph, a particular sentence, and if you're that character in that book, in that verse, in that uh, paragraph, in that sentence, they are perhaps uh, living in that moment. So, for example, you might open the book and find yourself as the character experiencing falling down as a result of tripping and now they're injured. And the character might very well be thinking to himself in that scenario, oh, wow, what has happened to me? I am in pain. I've fallen. I don't understand why I've fallen. This is terrible. This is awful. Who do I blame? And uh, going through all kinds of mental exercise is trying to explain why this has happened. Now contrast that to the author who's writing the book, or better yet, to the author who has finished the book. The author is looking, can look at any number of the chapters. He can start at the beginning, he can start at the end, he can open it to the same sentence where we just gave example where the character fell down, and can see what's going on at any point in the stream of the history of the character. And perhaps the author knows that since the character fell down in chapter 3, they also have the advantage of knowing that in chapter 4, that the character picks himself up or herself up and continues on, and by virtue of the fact of having fallen down, they avoided having been that much more ahead of the game and perhaps walking into the street and getting hit by a car and being killed. Now the author, since he wrote chapter 4, knows that there's a car coming down the street, turning the corner, and perhaps the person who's driving isn't looking, paying attention, or perhaps the brakes are not working or whatever, and that in fact this car is going to hit the person. But the character has no idea what's going on. They just know that they've fallen down and that they're upset and they may question the hypothetical author of their story, whether it be a god or a supreme being or saying, why have I fallen down? Well, they don't know that there is a car coming. Now, the analogy breaks down, but the point is that it shows us an example of how God, being the author, is outside time and he knows exactly what's going to eventually happen with each and every one of us. He doesn't choose those endings. We ourselves are making that choice for ourselves. We can choose to avoid the, the bump in the road and not fall down. We can choose to not pay attention and in fact trip and fall. Or we can, can choose to walk in the road and get hit by the car because we're not paying attention. Or we can choose to look both ways and avoid that. Uh, we can choose any number of things in this scenario, and yet at the end of it, 
God is at the conclusion and he knows which path we're ultimately going to choose and he knows the result thereof and so in that stream he is trying to break into each and every chapter of our life and use the events that are happening whether they be by our choice or someone else's choice and to try to speak to us through these events to move us to a conclusion which is in his will his will is that the end chapter will conclude with us understanding our condition i.e. that we are in sin that we are fallen from his grace and that we are separated from him to understanding that the only way we can return to that relationship with him is by repenting of that and turning to Jesus Christ by faith through grace and being restored to him again so that we can spend eternity in his presence we can still choose to do otherwise however it is his will that we choose that relationship in eternity and he is moving all things around us be they good or bad to eventuate that purpose and it's important for us to understand that whereas we think what's happening may be evil we're falling down on the street we're skinning our knee in reality God sees the car coming and he wants us to avoid it he wants us to cross safely the street to the other side so that we might be with him in eternity now again that's a uh, an analogy which breaks down but it gives us a glimpse into the understanding between finite and eternal into being in time and outside of time so as to the question question four which is what is the purpose of evil the answer well one there are many purposes but ultimately the purpose is to convict man of his inability his inadequacy and his sin to bring man to repentance to turn man to a right relationship with God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ Two, to temporarily demonstrate the certainty of man's eternal destiny outside a relationship with God three to refine and strengthen God's elect evil has a purpose and sometimes the purpose is to wake us up four to show God's mercy his justice his power and holiness again these are contrasts if we did not know evil we would not know good five to accomplish God's purposes in eternity again we are all hopelessly lost we're walking down the street and we're heading for the car and we're going to die eternally and be separated from him if that is not his purpose his purpose is that we cross the street safely but in order to do that sometimes we have to trip and fall and with that comes pain now in conclusion by review we asked and answered the following questions one we asked why does God permit evil for the present evil is the result of man's choice which was the prerequisite condition necessary for true free will on the part of Adam and Eve it continues as a reality as the result of man's continued separation from God as God works by his grace to return as many as possible back into a position of reconciliation to him by grace through faith in Jesus Christ Two, we asked why doesn't God do something about evil he did he sent his son Jesus Christ and when all who will have come to faith God will return and will judge all that is evil and put an end to it by casting evil and all of its attributes into hell three we asked where did evil originate evil originated with Satan and by choice of man entered into human history by man's nature and by his choice three we addressed proactively the question aren't there verses in the Bible that teach God creates or is responsible for evil the Bible is understood in its complete context and that no verse is understood by man's reasoning by his natural mind or by private interpretation or without the Spirit of God which comes by the new birth fourthly we asked what is the purpose of evil mainly to work together for good with all things according to God's purpose for the benefit of God's elect so overall we began the discussion with the classic hidden assumption that there is no God because if there were man reasons why would he sit around and do nothing well it is obvious that evil happens every day and since evil exists in the human universe God cannot after thoroughly discussing the issues hopefully we've learned that ultimately the problem of evil does not negate the existence of God it actually requires it we must remember that evil in whatever form it may take tribulation pain sickness death suffering etc 
It's never pleasant, nor is it immediately or soon understood, particularly when it strikes us personally. However, God's word, his wisdom, and his eternal counsel encourages saints to remember that according to Proverbs 3.12 and Hebrews 12.6, that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Take the example of correcting a child. If you've ever had a child or know someone that does have a child, it's not uncommon that a child misbehaves and that you spend an inordinate amount of time trying to teach the child the difference between good and bad, good and evil, and so forth. Ultimately, at some point, once these concepts are understood, talking comes to an end, and it becomes necessary to enforce some kind of correction, whether it be time out or something along those lines. Now, if you've ever put a child into the position of being on time out or some kind of punishment, taking away a privilege, something of that nature, all they know is the moment. They see themselves in this dilemma where the end of the world has come, and to them they feel separated from their parents due to the fact that their parents are disappointed or angry or upset, and that's all they can sense at the time. However, from the parent's perspective, they still love the child deeply and would do anything for that child, but ultimately they're not interested with only the present and the child's uh, feelings about the moment. Ultimately, the parent is interested in the overall well-being of that child as that child becomes an adult and enters into uh, the world to uh, interact on its own. They want to know that that child knows the difference between right and wrong, good and bad, good and evil. And so that is the ultimate concern for this parent in that scenario. So like the example of our child, we, we presently only partially know and understand what God is trying to achieve on an eternal plane. We tend to focus only on the chastisement, rather than the eternal results which God is trying to achieve. Lastly, while we will never have complete understanding and complete knowledge in this present world of God and His ways, it is worthwhile, if you remember nothing else, than not to trade what we know of God for what we don't know of God. Let us close in prayer. Father, I do thank you that you have not left us without understanding and without revelation of yourself, of your nature, of who you are, and of our relationship to you, Lord. I pray that you will allow us to humble ourselves to better understand who you are and who we are in relation to you, Lord. Let us not get caught up in the present world. Let us remember that we are pilgrims on this earth and that we are en route to our heavenly home which is our eternal home. Father, I pray that you will keep each and every one of us who know you and are called according to your purpose through this present time and through the tribulation now and to come. And Lord, we know that we have assurance that you will preserve us through all things, that we may come unto you as a finished work, that we may put our crowns at your feet. You have done all things, and we give you glory, honor forever and ever. Amen. I hope that this study has helped you to, in some small way, to understand better the concept of evil and of how we relate to God with respect to that. I thank you for listening to this study. I hope that, in some small way, it has deepened your understanding of who God is and your relationship to Him. If you have any questions about the Christian faith, about who God is, the Bible in general, I would encourage you to drop a line to Pastor Yeshua at yahoo.com. That is P A S T O R underscore Yeshua, Y E S H U A at yahoo.com. You can also contact us through Facebook at Pastor Yeshua. And thank you again for joining us, and may God bless your day.